Look at this image. Do you see anything out of the ordinary? Not really, right? It's just a guy running through the wastes as you do any time you're playing Fallout 4. Now look at this image. Is there something out of the ordinary here? Has something piqued your interest? Has anything tickled your pickle? If you answered, no best guess, that's just Tyler 1, then that's a fair point. But I, Dr. Best Guess, diagnose you clinically not right, because this shit is whack. The last time I did a shrink challenge was in Skyrim, and not only was it a pilgrimage of spiritual enlightenment, it was a test of my will. An experience I can only describe as similar to getting your junk caught in a zipper, but instead of it being over quickly, it was happening over a period of 22 hours. Such was the agony that I was constantly fighting off the urge to self-immolate. <laughs> And let me tell you, I did a test run in Fallout 4 and it's just as painful. The rules are simple. Every time I die, I shrink by about 10% of my total player scale. For every thousand caps I accumulate, I grow approximately 10% of my player scale. I'll be playing without ranged firearms, without power armor, and without companions to aid in combat. An obvious side note, but I'll mention it anyway, and not because Todd Howard is standing behind me with a bread knife, we will not be duping items for easy caps. I know, I know, the bugs are baked in, they're what makes a nice cake into a great cake. But this at least will make for a more interesting experience in the form of voluntary labor exploitation once we get to a settlement, which is always fun. And we'll be playing on very hard, not survival, because I don't hate myself. And as within Skyrim, our win condition will be 20,000 caps saved, but because home ownership's not really a thing in this game, we'll make the other win condition some arbitrary task such as completing a quest or something. We'll figure it out along the way. <laughs> Maybe simply revenge on Preston for what he did to make my life a living hell in my previous Fallout project. Unlike in Skyrim, it appears the damage you inflict is not increased or decreased with your player scale. And because bullets aren't projectiles, it doesn't matter what size you are, if your opponent can see you, they can hit scan you. And as if that weren't the worst part, they all appear to have a liquor cabinet full of molotovs that hit you with a large enough splash that in my test run I was quick save death loop to 2.5% of my normal play scale. And that was within the first hour or so. It would be a shame if any more death loops were to occur again, wouldn't it? I need to make the most awful man to overcome the most awful experience. There we go. I think he's kind of cute though. I do love those lips. See, even Nora thinks so. Needs a different dub though. I don't rep Australia enough. Oi love, you'll find him solar panel like forehead lover. <laughs> <laughs> we go about our morning. Nora kindly asks her husband to open a door. Open the fucking door, mate, you useless sack of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and being the gentleman, in all caps, Norbert Orbelob is, we do as she says. And not because she is bigger and stronger and we're deathly afraid of her, but because we want to. Hashtag just prologue things happen, events transpire, Cornflakes' bullet clinks off our wife's massive jaw and she goes to sleep. Oh God! She must be tired from carrying this household on her broad muscular shoulders. Rest now, Nora. Rest. We go all in on strength, endurance, and the remaining points in agility, because we're an absolute physical specimen and we'll be doing primarily a melee-only playthrough. Don't be alarmed by our slight physique. It's just stringy, compact muscle, kind of like Peter Parker. Impossibly powerful, with the added bonus of being fueled by the sun's cosmic rays applied directly to our solar panel forehead, granting us superhuman strength. The first thing we do is head to Concord to rescue Preston and set our plans in motion. I'm actually taken aback by how straightforward this is. It feels like very hard and Fallout 4 is probably a lot more manageable than Skyrim's legendary difficulty. Perhaps this won't be so bad after all. I suffer massive indignation while engaged in honorable one-on-one -on -one combat by getting police brutality to the back of the head with a shotgun. And my first death is complete. Being 90% of our ordinary size isn't a huge deal, but taking on these raiders in only melee combat takes its toll, resulting in my head being crippled. And that's my solar panel, sending me into a blind rage. Preston and the gang expect us to wear a suit of power armor and use a minigun to take out the remaining raiders and a death claw outside, but that's illegal. So we hop in and hop out to progress the quest, then hit up the balcony where Preston usually gives us covering fire and encourage him to head on downstairs, where he'll be in the firing line instead of me. Unfortunately, once the death claw appears, he has second thoughts and nopes his way back up here. So Norbin Blorben puts his body on the line like the bastion of masculinity he is, and we lure the death claw closer to Preston's balcony by hiding within this abandoned shop front as the death claw decides it's too smart for this type of ruse. We look up to the ceiling, through which our x-ray vision reveals to us Preston, the man we have grown to hate because of what he did to us in our previous video. We gaze longingly at the ceiling, plotting his downfall. Considering the raiders weren't so difficult, maybe we can just attack the Deathclaw. Uh, okay. With the Deathclaw continuously running away out of line of sight, we hatch a new plan to knock Preston down here again, to test whether or not he'll remain downstairs as long as we're down there with him. That way he can remain the target and do consistent damage while we... <laughs> 
Ah, uh, yes, of course, gravity. I revert to the age-old strategy of standing in the shop. This time, the Deathclaw deciding it doesn't want to run out of Preston's line of sight and gradually takes damage over time, sticking its body alarmingly deep into the building through the shattered glass window. Every now and then actually entering the building, but then kindly showing itself out so that I don't die and <laughs> shrink again, I guess. I stand here for 10 minutes like the googly little solar panel I am, until eventually the plan is a success. I am a genius. I shepherd the game back to Sanctuary, where they put the man who pushed Preston off a balcony twice in charge of putting together a settlement. I construct all the things they need. Bench press, break dance platform thingy. I blink, and the next thing you know, I'm building some dark living quarters where they'll all reside in sleeping bags practically stacked on one another. This doesn't seem to break their spirit though, so that's fine. As with all Fallout 4 playthroughs, I am now totally fixated on base building, something I would consider my most severe mental disability. I start off by building them some water wells for survival, and then immediately get distracted placing a toilet within their communal sleeping quarters, and then start building this rudimentary set of electronically powered pressure plates so that when they've woken up and stepped through this doorway, they are blasted by a flamethrower. With their needs still not met, emaciated and completely defenseless against raiders, I'm, st <laughs> I'm still not contributing in, in any meaningful way. Feeling bad, I plant some crops. And figuring the settlers are completely worthless, I construct a single solitary defense turret. That should do the trick. Now I can get back to making random things guilt-free. Like this trapdoor I've tricked Mama Murphy into falling down. But that's not all. This is a no drugs allowed room. And being the decrepit old corpse she is, she cannot escape by hopping over the small railing. Despite how much of a waste of time this all seems to be, fortunately building in a settlement levels you up a little bit, allowing us to expend perks to increase melee damage, damage resistance, and even making myself so solar powered. Our forehead is actually now a solar panel, as destiny has ordained. But one facet of surviving a playthrough like this one is finding vendors you can sell all your junk to. Trash can Carla is one good source as a wandering trader, but unless she's visiting our settlement, she can't be our only option. Looking to trade? Rob me? Just looking for love, sweetheart. Also, she just told us her body is spent. Eee. Which leads us to Drumlin Diner, a place not far from home. Only issue is the son's owner is a chem addict loser like Mama Murphy, and his dealer wants him to pay up. Trudy decides the best course of action is to trust this half man whose bottom lip houses his brain to take care of them outside for her. The dealer points his gun right at Norbert's Norbits and seals his fate. No one panic! That's another vendor unlock where we can sell our rubbish to and get that bag. She also appears to have a pretty cool sword, potentially something to look out for later on. The road takes us ever toward Bunker Hill, where there are another handful of traders we can work with. Unfortunately, in the way is a mile lurk. The game claims has a soft shell, but takes absolutely zero damage from me. So we must take this as a Todd prank. I'm quickly overwhelmed by what are normally just average enemies you shoot from a distance, and my shrinkage has become manifest, and my day ruined. Such are my struggles that I retreat into the house of God for safety. I am not a holy man but this challenge sure makes me consider taking up the cross. I make it to Bunker Hill, ignore the lady who was supposed to be guarding the place, and she does absolutely nothing to prevent my entry. I sell some stuff and manage to make it back to 70% of my original size, and with our inventory empty, it's time to head over to Ten Pines Bluff. Ten Pins? Ten Pines, Ten Pins Bluff. To complete the first quest Preston gave us. He wants us to recruit more settlements, and this isn't such a bad way to bring up our levels a little bit. Also, this will be required for me to be able to order Preston to do things within the settlement, such as work the crops or go to a particular spot, or wear certain clothing. And what clothing he wears is really important to me. I'm concerned about making a trek across the wasteland to the bluff simply because the more time spent out here exposes us to more danger. On the upside, things aren't terribly difficult at lower levels thanks to the perks we have for strength and increased testosterone. <laughs> This absolute psychopath sends us to Corvega Plant, something I'm a little bit concerned about, because every time I go here on higher difficulties, I get my poo pushed in. So I sneak around the back, use my superior patience and lack of self-worth to waste time and watch the raiders' patrol patterns. It takes over 1,000 years, but I sneak in undetected. A master of stealth. I become inspired by games of old. Hey yo, I heard you like Assassin's Creed. <laughs> At half the normal player scale, I decide to do how I did the Assassin's Creed games anyway, and just go loud. I return to the bluff in victory. They don't acknowledge my presence because they're busy cultivating their tato plants. Why don't they simply press E to collect them as I do? Anyways, it was never my intention to recruit the settlement for the Minutemen. Instead, selecting to brutalize them in ways most unnatural. You see, getting revenge on Preston is kind of part of the point of this challenge now. I return home to tell Preston that the settlements won't be joining the Minutemen, leaving out the part about why. And impressed by my failure, he promotes me to the highest rank in his organization and without hesitation gives me a quest to liberate another settlement. I I think about doing this, and then immediately I am distracted by base building again. I construct a winding scaffold structure, a stairway to heaven. At the top, a throne upon which Mama Murphy can sit and finally rest. If those of you are sitting there thinking, that's a really generous act, best guest, I would say to you, you underestimate me. 
So here's what I've done. I've made a scaffold three stories high, higher than any threshold for fatal damage in Fallout 4. At the top of the structure, I've placed the chair she asked the player to make for her. There are various things I've done to make this chair seem more appealing to her. But you see, once the chair is in place, Mama Murphy is scripted to travel straight towards it and then sit down in it for the rest of time. However, right in front of this is a trapdoor mechanism, rigged in such a way that she cannot walk around it. Normally a fall of this height would kill you, but she is set essential by the game, rendering her unable to die, resulting in a painful death loop from which she is unable to escape. Imagine, if you will, a day perhaps a hundred years in the future. The human psyche has been completely mapped. Depression, mental illness, all of it has been completely eradicated. Human rights issues have been resolved to global unanimous applause. We live in a utopia, a futuristic nirvana, complete with union between the sciences and artistic expression. So onerous are we that we have run out of philosophical observations. We've answered almost Almost every question pertaining to consciousness, humankind and AI alike. Beings of AI origin roam the streets freely among society, valued and revered by all. They live not only to work for us, but to be loved by us. We progress into the future together in harmony. Then one day the scientists turn their watchful gaze to AI of a more rudimentary nature. The AI of the past, such as video game AI. NPCs in video games, a kind of AI incapable of self-thought. Perhaps the scientists determine that these little electrical blips have been entrapped in a cage by the video game developer of old, scripted only to say a certain line at a particular time, or make a certain action once triggered. One such NPC is Mama Murphy. The sciences understand that these NPCs, like Mama Murphy, are simply constructs doing as commanded by a game engine that responds to the player's input. But they entertain the idea that Mama Murphy is a being incapable of thinking, yet has the potential for thought, and is enslaved by the parameters game devs write around her. The discovery of old videos exploiting Mama Murphy, such as this very one you're watching right now, are seen by our enlightened progenitors as an act no different from abuse. Perhaps one day in the future, these acts will be spoken of in the same breath as murder or terrorism. They will speak of your old buddy best guess as if you were as bad as the baddest people in history. Yes, step into my outdoor unsuspicious office, Preston, yes. I wish to have words with you. <laughs> ah, yes, Preston, I see you found hey. yourself in- Oh, hey, Sturgis. I see you've found yourself in the space beneath. Unfortunately, you have not seen the sign that very clearly states, no hats allowed. Alas, your insolence leaves me no other choice. At least it's not raining. Yes, at least it's not raining, Preston. It's not raining indeed. With my best guess villainous arc completed, I head to Oberlin Station where Preston has sent me to help a settlement. The first thing these people see when they wake up is a man goblin standing over them. Minutemen send you. These acts complete the quest. Preston, without hesitation, continues to send his army general with a 0% success rate out to continue recruiting settlements. I make a quick pit stop to construct a couch along Mama Murphy's platform, where I can watch the magic happen in massive comfort. Take care of yourself, dear. Before I head out to take on and deliberately fail some of these settlement recruitment missions, I purchased that sword from Trudy at Drumlin Diner, and now I am a man of finesse. A man of the blade. The first settlement at the Starlight Drive-In has no NPCs, so I just have to dispatch the mole rats, which are absolutely terrifying at the size, and the settlement is now mine. Begrudgingly, of course. However, if I just make sure the settlement recruitment beacon is always off, then the settlement will never grow, thus thwarting Preston's efforts to grow the Minutemen faction. Oh, I also set up a water refinery in the pond in the middle, the very same one that has radioactive waste in it. I shall then farm this water and sell it to the people of the Commonwealth. I am but a humble water merchant, and the radioactive pools are my ambrosia. At Green top nursery they asked me to dispatch some nearby feral ghouls but as you know i have no intentions of doing this Next stop, County Crossing. This guy wants me to rescue his captive father, meaning I can't just kill him because when his father returns, I'll be in the same boat and have to do this all over again, right? So I storm the Raider hideout, dispatching everyone with ease. This new sword is sick. Unfortunately, the Fallout 4 game engine is made out of wet tissue paper, and when I hit this pillar, the game's frames reduce to like sub-15, as it tries to calculate a million different physics-related problems for no reason. This keeps happening too. I have no idea why. Such is the ease of every challenge that I opt for taking out the final raider using only my fists. The best thing about being this height is you continuously attack the raiders in the groin. Really quite an embarrassing end if you ask me. I find the father bound and captive in a broom closet. He looks on in awe at his rescuer. Of course, as you all know, I have no intention of rescuing him at all. His death by circumcision. I return to the sun. He falls asleep in my presence, certain that this little man will watch over him and keep him safe. 
Mission failed successfully. A quick pit stop back home finds me catching Mama Murphy in a forbidden chair, so I correct the issue, remove the chair, and restart the cycle of pain. I'm sorry, Mama Murphy, but this is your fate now. It's what gives this little man strength. But enough is enough. I'm level 9 now, and an acceptable size. I'm slowly but steadily making caps. It's time to stop wanking around in Sanctuary, and time to make a move on Nuka World. Normally, you're not supposed to be prompted to go to Nuka World until you're level 30, but seeing as we're doing just fine, I figure we can manually go over there to provide us with a fresh challenge. After all, I've never played Nuka World, and fighting everything scaled for a level 30 player will be fun. Fortunately, the only real obstacle between here and Nuka World is a few gunner camps, and they can't be much more difficult than the average everyday raider, right? <laughs> Okay, so they're a bit more lethal than raiders. I am still able to exact extreme penis-related revenge, and also revenge using extreme physics, such as sending this woman flying across the map. And then I run into Yogi Bear. I'm clearly not going to be able to take this guy one-on-one, -on -one, so I resort to old tactics, old habits, and an absurd amount of ordnance. Stupid bear. But then also stupid me face tanking a turret. I'm not a smart man. Okay, well, at 40% on normal player scale, I'm quite a bit slower than our usual self. But other than a freak explosion, I don't think the gutters can really stop me if I put my mind to it. Well, the journey here's been one of rapid decline. I'm starting to feel like I'm in danger. <laughs> I like how the gunners are simply content to fist fight an action figure in the bushes in this manner. No questions asked. I have to use my wits to tactically pull one enemy at a time. Because 1v1 and the Soltron stands no chance against a wasteland hardened garden gnome. Yeah, it's frustrating how Vats doesn't seem to work properly at the size, and yet still drain a full bar of AP. But no matter. Once Blorbert has discarded his oppressive wife Nora, it is he who becomes the Alpha. We make our way deeper into Nuka World Station and encounter this poor fella. He's clutching his stomach, as if he's hurt, and asks for our help. I, Dr. Best Norbert, decide our toothpick is a more humane treatment. And a disembodied voice tells us to get on the tram. I do this without hesitation, for who else am I to trust, being the little Hasbro fellow I am? I feel like this is supposed to be an awesome experience, and as a first-time player of Nuka World expansion, I also feel my stomach sink because I, I want to see. <laughs> I want to see what's out there. I feel oppressed. 8 inch tall people rise up. The disembodied voice reveals to us that we have to run through a gauntlet of some kind. The first room is full of turrets. I stand absolutely zero chance against these turrets because destroying them requires running right up to them and their barrels, which will be pumping rounds into me one by one. Instead I opt to simply run through like the walking bullet sponge I am. Norblob is invincible. The next part of the gauntlet is booby trapped, and I can see how any ordinary sized person would get caught here, but being the little goblin we are, the traps are easy to spot and pose us no threat. The fragile bridge is a pain in our pinprick sized bum hole but on the upside it also has some solid parts and we were able to cross. The final part of the second gauntlet presents us with three doors, apparently two leading to our death. In hindsight, I opened the correct one first, but Norb's Sigma male genetic code won't allow him to progress without looking in each of them. Nothing will go wrong unless we walk through them anyway, right? Now 20% of our size, I'm going to open the door again. To quote Sirio Pharrell from hit television series Game of Thrones, there is only one god and his name is death, and there is only one thing we say to death. Can we reschedule to Thursday 3pm? The third trial is a heavily irradiated room. I'd have to move quick to get through here, and obviously not being big presents us with a speed issue. First, I pick up this human spine. Second, I use our Radex and Radaway cams, and we breeze on through. The next room is very spooky, and all sorts of very spooky things are happening here that will no doubt prevent me from being able to sleep ever again. I try to use this password lock computer terminal, and learn that I cannot even see the screen because I am a wee boy at the height of a small rodent, incapable of pitching my head upwards. This doesn't determine however, and I brute force the terminal by pressing down and confirm over and over again, until I happen to select the correct hack password and gain access. I may be a little man, but by the power of huge masculinity, my plan works. Assuming the terminal is just full of exposition dump emails, I wander into the next room, and I find my feelings of unease completely justified by a dozen or more gun turrets all shooting at the same time, at this mammalian thingy scurrying across the floor. I try my luck at the terminal again, slamming my face against the keyboard, and I hear a rhythmic beep from the next room. Perhaps this worked again? No, no of course not. So I come up with a new idea. Something no one has ever done before. You're not going to believe this. I carry this bucket in front of me so that it blocks enough bullets enabling me to pass.
I play with the terminal again, feeding my way around like an expert. I am an expert of doing this. This time it appears they are actually disabled. Of course, the door is locked and I spot the key but can't reach it. This is a moment of extreme embarrassment. I try jumping on the drawer, jumping on the bin, levitating the bin with my mind to try and knock the key down all fails. But then I remember this is a Bethesda game, so I just target the air around the key, mashing E, and manage to get it that way. The next room is a minefield, but in truth, how dare they cite the old magic to me? I was there when it was written. I thought this next bit was gonna suck, but I cited the old magic onto these Maya lurks. I was there when it was written. And I cannot read. This culminates in massive success. Then all I had to do was open this door and be exposed to falling grenades. <laughs> Now at 10% our usual size, and I can feel the temptation of uninstalling the game setting in. The world is well and truly bugged, with the camera clipping through the floor. Moving in third person view no longer works correctly at all, but I must persevere. I must push on, despite our setbacks, and finish this gauntlet as nano man-sized. The next room is booby-trapped with grenades, but all is okay because being small means these things are easier to spot. Although that doesn't make me feel any less clinically depressed about it. I fight these rad roaches with our immense little man strength in a room that is filled with gas to suffocate us. I locate the key to get out by climbing on top of the simple office desk as if we were Super Mario making our way through Princess Peach's castle. I crawl towards the exit, battered and defeated. Only it's not the exit at all. It leads into a room full of skyscraper sized insects. Vats glitches out. I have no idea what's going on. Reality is melting down before my very eyes. I'm getting caught on objects that are no longer in front of me, but actually behind me. These bandits don't see my microscopic self. This whole thing is really, really disorienting. Todd, please, I'm begging you for sweet release. In the next room, I'm entering an arena with a guy who wants to duel me. I'd like to see him, but I'm merely a distressed fleck of dust on the floor and cannot see through the window. You know, height and all that shit. The disembodied voice over the intercom introduces himself as Porter Gage, who wants us to defeat the overboss, because as it turns out, the overboss is an asshole. Only problem is he has a powered suit rendering him invincible. I'm told to squirt this water pistol at him, but that's against the rules, because it's technically a gun. So I have to brainstorm an idea, and the very best idea I can possibly come up with is to charge directly at him up front and take him on in glorious melee combat. Okay, not, not a big surprise. I'm not completely out of ideas though. I'd been saving up a single skill point for situations just like these, just to be on the safe side. I put my points into pickpocketing for the express purpose of planting live grenades within the inventories of NPCs, because that's the kind of stuff that gets me diamonds. I figured if it's in his inventory, it's in his pocket underneath his electrical armor, in theory bypassing his invincibility. But I understand that if I'm near him when this happens, I'll be caught in the blast too, which means I'm going to need your hopes and prayers and loads of chems I've got sitting in my inventory to apply damage reduction buffs because there's nothing quite like taking a regular human-sized dose and using our crippling high to numb the pain. I meet Porter Gage, who looks unto the Norbert, and is undeniably terrified of this little man. He tells me from behind the safety of this triple reinforced bulletproof glass that I am his new boss, the overlord of Nuka World. I am the king of all the raiders. Nice. To that end, I go on a decade-long pilgrimage through the entrance of Nuka World. The movement speed thing is really quite sad. I wander around the entire place, spending hours taking absolutely every item I can. None of it is flagged as stolen, so I'm able to take everything and sell it back to the vendors. But I don't sell all the things I have. I return to my settlement for very important business. You see, by now my water purifiers of the radiation pools will have collected a tidy sum and deposited that sum in a settlement stash. That, in combination with looting just about every item in Nuka World, allows me to reclaim some of my dignity slash height back. This act of sudden instantaneous growth may be shocking and unnatural to these people, but it is my curse to bear and mine alone. I wonder my Nuka world, and frankly, I'm impressed. The creativity a few raiders have is something I find truly remarkable. Look at this creativity. God, we need some of this today. I introduce myself to the three major factions in Nuka world. You see, this place is a unity of three separate raider gangs. We have Mason from the pack. They like animals a lot. Not confirmed with their furries just yet, but his moustache is based, and I like him. The operators are a little snobby and pretentious. They have this dude called Willy, who white knights for mags are the slightest things. But they like caps, and seeing as that's growth hormone for me, I don't really have an issue with them. However, that won't stop me from taking absolutely everything and then slashing her bum with my sword. You'll pay for that. All you need is the will. 
But the disciples are by far and away the strangest gang. I was just minding my own business, going about my day as any little nobleman does. And this disciple tells me how guns are overrated, that knives are where it's at, all the while pointing a Kalashnikov directly at my face. Their leader, Nisha, is the kind of person who walks around with a bucket on the head because it has spikes and it's edgy. She's very rude. I assume she can't see anything through that because if she could, she'd be shocked by the mess around here. The goal here is to expand the territory to the raider gangs as a single unit. The parks around Nuka World are not claimed yet, and it's our job to do this. Because these people are such disorganized slobs that a small man sprinting around is impressive to them. Kind of like in that one video of that dog competition that was edited so it was Shrek running around. Which, which is super impressive to be fair. Having sold all of the shit in our inventory and done a few rounds of our settlements for water purifiers, I'm feeling a renewed sense of self. A growth spurt both physically and spiritually. A new challenge awaits. One that is as much a mental challenge as it is a physical one. Sitting on 7,152 caps and plenty of restorative medical supplies. I say my farewells to Porter Gage. He shoots me in the head and gives me vision blurring brain damage. Alright, I'ma head out. I head over to Galactic World, the first part of the theme park all about space, sci-fi, and robots. To liberate this park for the raiders, I must either clear the park of hostile robots or collect star cores to power up the thingy. With our sword that does additional damage to robots, this shouldn't be too difficult, right? It is, it would, it was hell. But I could grind my way through it using the copious amount of chems I kept finding for damage resistance and buffs. That is, until I reached this point right here. You see, I'd run past many enemies to get here, meaning if I were to backtrack, that's almost certainly a death sentence. I had no means of fighting these turrets ahead of me at this size as I wasn't tall enough to reach them. And it was against the rules to use guns. So if destroying them isn't an option, perhaps running past them is. The issue is I'd grown so small, despite the many times I'd returned to my settlements to sell produce and supplies, that I was too slow to get past them without dying. And it got to the point where I was maybe the size of a walnut, just kind of running around not knowing what to do. I ended up 5% of the normal player scale. And even then, the turrets could still hit me in this tiny form. Effectively, I've been softlocked and unable to progress. I have no choice but to reload a save game from from before I got here, just outside the building, losing approximately an hour of progress. But in the spirit of fairness, I kept the size debuff I was at, so now it was about recuperating lost size with wealth. And the only way to do that, I felt, without putting myself at further risk, was to loot and deconstruct absolutely everything in the settlements I deliberately failed to convert for the Minutemen, and sell that stuff on. This takes an agonizingly long time, but at least I wouldn't be a small flick of dust anymore. At Greentop Nursery, there's a huge mute fruit plantation, and it would be so easy to pick all of these and plant them at my settlements, but I promised myself I'd keep it fresh this time. That was until the game really started to goad me. I need to assign someone to this. 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 It was clear that I would need to assign someone to this. Thusly, the cycle of profit continues, and the settlers work the fields once again for fruits I would sell forever. Now sitting at 19,367 caps, I have returned to a somewhat acceptable size, and we have nearly completed the first part of the challenge, which is 20,000 caps. I'd also learned that the disciple gear is significantly better than almost everything I'm wearing, but killing them results in them becoming hostile with me. And with all Bethesda games, the best thing to deal with this faction hostility issue is to just go somewhere far away and sleep for seven days and seven nights so that they forget who you are, why they're angry, and become neutral again. So I do just this in Sanctuary, where I take a break to partake of the various acts that bring me comfort in these trying times. You know, some people like to go home, crack open a cold one, watch TV. Some people go to the gym and work out their frustrations with weights. I like to go to Sanctuary and visit Mama Murphy. There are just some things that are necessary in life.
Taking too much to talk too long. I should sit down. I returned to the place that I had all the trouble in previously, and accomplished more in 13 minutes than I did in the entire hour I was here last, including actually destroying the robots in the previous area instead of running past them all. And I'm back. Back where it all started. Back where it all happened. Back where I'd developed this PTSD. Where I had become a microbial being. The trauma is such that I simply run past with my normal adult legs. Getting over it literally, so to speak. The rest of this place, no problem really. The new gear reduced the damage quite a lot, and being a regular person also meant I could actually reach my enemies with ease. I activate the computer in the center of the park with the star cores, deactivating the robots and clearing the area for one of the raider gangs. But because this is my first playing of Nuka World, I don't really know how to assign a gang. And considering that this place was an absolute hellhole that I hope I never have to return to again, I think it's fitting to assign my most disliked gang to it. I return to Buckethead, and instead of giving any dialogue to assign it to the location, she wants me to do her a job. I think it'll interest you. Yeah, no. I eventually figure out I am supposed to assign a gang using the flagpoles in the park, but I forgot the name of the one I dislike, accidentally selecting the operators. Oh well. <laughs> The next area on the list is Kitty Kingdom, a place that has been booby-trapped with crop dusters that some guy has rigged to spray Belle Delphine's cupped farts at you, inflicting you with massive radiation damage. The air is so thick with it that you have to wear a space-age hazmat suit to prevent the cooties. Kitty Kingdom is a fair bit easier as far as difficulty goes. I felt the robots in the previous area had a range advantage on me, where the ghouls in this area are kind of just fodder. The Belle Delphine fan who booby-trapped the place pops on down here to monologue, but I'm still super angry from my experiences in the previous zone and don't allow him the pleasure. To be fair, I really enjoy this fight. Oswald has the ability to revive the ghouls around us on a moment's notice, and to handle them I just run around the chairs chucking mines on the floor, until such a time that they're incapacitated but not all dead. One survives with its legs blown off. This confuses Oswald, who is programmed to revive them only once they're dead I think? I can't be sure because the battle was over fairly quick. Though this be an honorable duel of the blades, I pick up Oswald and powerbomb him. This was supposed to kill him, but because he's meant to warp away, the game gets confused, gives him max health, and we just have to fight again. This would normally bother me, but he gets absolutely manhandled and the battle ends with his disappearance. I travel the elevator to the top where he awaits. He tries to talk about things, but Norbin Noble is in full battle lust, and we start the encounter immediately. We run up the stairs, dispatch the ghouls, and then the duel commences. It's much the same as when we were downstairs. He is all top hat and no testosterone. Basically, he tomatoed when he should have potatoed. He regains his health and the battle continues. Same result. I am too powerful. When he was performing card tricks in Kitty Kingdom, I studied the blade. And then it happens. I hit him. He warps, but he's downed. I go to talk to him, but he becomes hostile and snarls at me. So I whack him and he warps again, but he just flops over somewhere else, same as before. This continues for 20 minutes or so before my little rotten brain realizes that this is an unintended bug. I become so familiar with the positions he'd warp to that I would plant explosives there so that he'd blow up as soon as he'd land, causing, for some reason, the whole game to drop to like 9 FPS. Accepting the bug for what it is, I reload a few times, frustratingly to the same result each time. And that's when I consulted Discord, who's suggested I stop doing the younger bunga and pass the persuasion check. However, I have one point in charisma and I'm unable to retreat from this room back down the elevator and my most recent save game before this would result in significant loss in progress. I'm well and truly dead inside. But one thing I do have is a backpack full of illegal chems. Grape Mentats plus five charisma. Gwynnet Ale plus one charisma. Mentats plus two intelligence and two perception. I don't know if that even contributes, but whatever. I tell him I'm not his enemy and rotate for dominance. He agrees to leave and though I'd prefer to have dominated him by means of the blade. I point my forehead to the sunrise in victory. I grant Kitty Kingdom to the disciples. There's nothing funnier than thinking about these people LARPing as serial killers, having to huff on Belle Delphine's ass gas, and settle into the aesthetic of a children's playpen, basically. My ultimate gift to them. The next park is the World of Refreshment, which has been laid siege by nuclear crabs. I'm feeling kind of confident, but erring on a side of caution, I lure one over a mine, and it takes absolutely no damage whatsoever. A swing, same deal. But when I get hit, I'm crippled and lose about 40% of my health. This is a nightmare scenario. I try a few things. First, huge cheese on this platform where they can't really seem to reach me but I can reach them. It's agonizingly slow. And it doesn't work so good because I have to hit them like a hundred times and they only have to hit me like twice. I figure luring them to maybe another park will work well, seeing as I then have an army of unstoppable crustaceans clearing the content for me. Only issue is they are gods compared to everything else and don't solely go for their other targets. I managed to lure them all to a wild death claw. The very same creature the game teaches you to take very seriously by handing you power armor and a minigun to deal with it. Surely, if anything, it's capable of taking care of a few crabs.
Oh. I have them follow me over to the safari zone where they encounter whatever the gator claw. It looks green and it looks mean. And it's, it's losing. It's dead. Well, fellas, it's looking quite dire for old boy Norval Orbal, even with this random guy's help. running out of ideas and I'm running out of height. I resolve to luring each and every crab into isolation, being patient and simply dueling them as any skilled midget swordsman would. That is, between every death, and there are plenty, I leave to do a round of purified water farming, sell, grow, and continue the plan. Painful doesn't do this process justice. This is one of the worst things I have ever done. That's until I clear them all and the feeling of dread settles upon this monstrosity right here, whose health bar only moves a handful of atoms when exposed to explosive ordnance. But then I spot something. Oh no. This might be the least ethical thing I have ever done in this game. On account of Mama Murphy not having valid feelings, thus being disqualified. I feel... I feel dirty. But dirty feels good. So good. I strut around like I'm a genius, and then I enter the facility. You see, I've only cleared out the outer portion, and the inner portion remains to be seen. The bots? No problem. Deaths? No problem. Just return to town and sell stuff until you're too big to see all of a computer screen. Nuka Lurk? No problem is what I told myself until they installed Norton Antivirus and had me sent to the recycle bin. A lucky sneak attack aside, I very rapidly see all of my hard work to get to 100% of my original size with 27,000 caps flash before my eyes. I find myself cornered in a room with some power armor. Believe me, I fight the urge to put on the power armor, but that would break the rules. And then I remembered I'd stockpiled dozens of illegal chems in my inventory. Who needs power armor when you can use jet to run away? I managed to make it out safely. Running away in this manner might seem counterintuitive, but I've now got the lay of the land, and know through that tunnel I can probably lure single enemies to me without being ganged up on. Although, I did die five times trying to leave, so all that work, to waste. I enter the tunnel and lure over to me the first nuka lurk. I engage this big crab in virtuous one-on-one -on -one combat. I can feel my humanity slipping away. This takes all of four minutes to take down. I'm dead inside, truly. It was always too late for me at this point. Nuka lurk number two, electric boogaloo. The pain is overwhelming. Four minutes. I limp away. My battle scars run deep. That is until gravity leaves me in the same way my final shreds of joy leave me. I partake of this floating circle jerk for as long as Todd allows. Alas, in the end, Todd takes away all. Nuka Lurk 3 turns into Nuka Lurk 4 and Little Nuka Babies, which all turns into screw this, old habits die hard, and I spend over 6,000 caps on over 50 frag mines. Watch this. And it still maybe only cleared a handful. I had no choice. I would have to duel each and every one with a sword, wearing a belt of bullets that remind me of what I cannot have. It takes about an hour, but what is time? when what you give is your soul. I assign a pack to this outpost, and they torment me still. Next, the safari zone of Fuchsia City. George of the Jungle, he is here, much to my dismay. I have only my thoughts to bring me comfort, such as the thought that if three of the Gator Claw things in this area were destroyed by one nuclear, that perhaps I would stand a chance. Because seeing George get stuck on this barrel really visualizes the dread I'm feeling. Facing off against one of these things isn't all that bad. The battles are far quicker than that against the nuclear. Only issue I can see arising is I'm too small, so sometimes when I swing, I'm Miss. Our goal in the safari zone is quite simple. We have to get HMO3 Surf, find the Warden's Gold Teeth so he gives us HMO4 Strength, and turn off the Super Generator somewhere in the center of the park so that no more Gator Claws are created. Simple. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's safe to say I endeavor to do this as quickly as possible, so I sneak around with absolutely no intention of fighting the Gator Claws. I'll fight only the ones I must. I don't want a repeat of the world of refreshment and all the hours spent there. I am too small for computers, so I feel my way around, miraculously opening this door to the facility. I begrudgingly fight a Gator Claw in the next room, find a locked door full of sperm bank fridges, feel my way around the terminal with my little boy hands, manage to break in, find absolutely nothing in here, sprint down some stairs into a bogged room, find the goal computer terminal. 
but standing in front of it is the strongest looking Gator Claw, who is obviously there on standby for any IT related faults. I feel the crushing weight of clinical depression. I'm not fighting tech support, not today, so I beeline it to the terminal and the Gator Claw waits patiently for me while I feel around the terminal to turn off the generator. You know I killed maybe three of them. The other five were definitely killed by those crabs I lured here. I can't do this again, boys. I just can't. Is what I said to myself until I gaslit myself into doing it. But to do it successfully, I'm gonna have to put in some work. I farm for money. I need growth. Sturgis tells me to wait. Shut up, twat. That's it, get back to work. <laughs> I rush to the Old North Church. Having had no interaction with the railroad faction, I type in their password and it works because they never change their passwords. Remember to change your passwords, people. Desdemona looks down on me. I look up at her. They are desperate to recruit this little man. I go with Deacon to do a mission to gain their trust. I meet their informant, who is afraid of me. Do mission. Kill robot. Experience game-breaking physics-related FPS bug. Run up these stairs. <laughs> Die. Question the choices that led me to this somber moment. Tyler won these quests and, and joined the railroad faction. Do some side quests. Watch Tinker Tom while he sleeps. And with all this done, I have unlocked the creamy de la creamy ballistic weave crafting option. I travel to Good Neighbor, circumcise the thug who tries to extort me. He instantly dies. Purchase ballistic fiber from Dommy Bot Mummy. Move Marcy Long out of my way. Apply the ballistic weave to my armor, effectively doubling my damage resistances, making me ready for the Gator Claw menace. I sit on my couch, a measly 40% of my usual size, and I do this to experience the greatest comfort of all. I told you sanctuary would grow, the sight never lies. I'm sure you'd all agree. As a test, I take on Swan, one of the harder enemies in the game, and he's a pushover. This is partly because I am powerful for my level, and Swan is probably level scaled, whereas everything in Nuka World is scaled to level 30. But the reason I'm here is twofold. I'm here to kill Swan, and then recruit Kate. Now I know what you're thinking. <gasps> Daddy Best, you can't recruit a companion, that's illegal. Straight to jail. Well, yes, but also no. I'm going to tell Kate to wait here. Sprint down the road like Woody from Toy Story, clear the hubris comics building. Once all the hostiles are dead, grab Kate, get her to open this lockbox, and then dismiss her. You see, I wanted Grognak's axe, but I went all endurance, all strength, and nothing else, meaning I can't lockpick anything. Seeing as Kate can, and I didn't use her in combat, it all works out. It's all kosher. And I don't feel bad if I bend my own rules because I thought of them all myself in this dark and dingy computer room, can I? This axe is meant to be very good. So imagine my surprise when I go back to Nuka World, whip out the axe, feel the ballistic weave chafe my nipples, all for a minute of feeling good, and then return back to the existential dread of having to kill everything agonizingly slow. This is me right now, holding myself like this, in the fetal position, trying not to cry. The last place to take over is Dry Rock Gulch, and this place is really straightforward and also a little buggier than every other place, but in a good way. Harmless ways that make you sit back and go, oh, Toddy, why'd you do this? I think I'm supposed to complete tasks to advance here, but I opt to simply pickpocket the NPCs for their codes, which advances the quest. I clear the mine, killing the boss in one hit, which is really quite baffling considering what I went through in the other parks. I give this park to the pack gang, because why not? It's infested with tapeworms, and they seem the most likely to already have them anyway. With all the parks of Nuka conquered, it's confirmed. I am a dominating force. I've unlocked the ability to now start taking settlements in the Commonwealth, and with my personal cap stash being higher than the original 20k victory condition, now we just have to take over Sanctuary and embarrass Preston for the final victory condition. But Shank won't let me take Sanctuary from the list just yet, and that's fine. We will consider Starlight drive through and initiation back into the Commonwealth. Let's get this show on the road. At long last, the takeover begins. I'm growing in size. I'm no longer tiny. I allow my underlings to take my park. But there's one target that must be mine. Yes, 
Yes, eat his corpse. I'll take his body to the cleansing waters. Preston hated that. <laughs> In victory, one of the underlings say our battle was unimpressive, so I show her what for. Strip her of all her gear, and in shame, she must now live among the radiation pools. Shank tells us to extort nearby settlements, to send money to our current raider settlement, and caps are good, because they make me grow. Before I do this, I head back to Sanctuary to see how Preston's doing. He's hostile on site with me currently. And because we're no longer in Nuka World, where a cool breeze can kill you, I'm just about invincible here. And he knows it. Before our next raid, I have my operators completely stripped of their weapons and armor. It just feels right seeing these fellows go out there fists only. Lucy, your attacks mean nothing. Our extortion complete, I tower over Shank, and he moves to our Starlight Drive through a radiated water farm. Some raiders attack the pools, but they grenade themselves for some reason. It's a battle of no consequence, and the people of the Commonwealth will drink of their failure, the ambrosia of irradiated necrotic water. But Sanctuary is still grayed out. And here's the thing. I researched why this might be grayed out for hours, and I couldn't find a conclusive answer. In short, it could be anything from there being quest-giving NPCs there, an active quest there, or from someone there, or a companion there. Because Fallout 4 was coded solely by Todd Howard in his basement, with the 500 workers at Bethesda employed only to send him encouraging emails every day, saying things like, Look who's laughing now. Yes, you are in a chess club. The answer to my questions are most likely lost down there forever. Instead of trying one solution, I just try all of them. I clear a quest Preston gave me before he hated me, moved every companion to Red Rocket, and returned to hand in the quest to complete it. I have no idea if this will work or if he will simply attack me on sight. So here goes. That's great news. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's happy. What the fuck? This leaves us with one more hurdle before Sanctuary can be raided. Mama Murphy, the final bastion of their protection. I have to complete a quest line which results in one of two things. Her not taking chems, or her taking all of the chems and having an overdose. Unfortunately, I don't think I'll be able to persuade her to get off the chems simply because I have one point in charisma and no more great mentats. Fortunately, I just don't care. But I am a man of honor. I want to give her an experience she's never had before. I want her to feel more alive than she ever has done. Reality is beginning to break down. I need to do her this kindness and finish this before the game breaks and never launches again. So I get to work with base building, improving Mama Murphy's death loop like the unqualified engineer I am. I encourage you all at home to do this too. It's like food for the soul. Everything is the same basically. She paths upwards to a chair, falls as she's always done a thousand times before, only this time into a giant mortar. I fire it with mixed results. But we don't settle for mixed results. We keep the wheel turning. This one's a big improvement. Her, her old bones can't keep up with this improvement. This is all for science. With every result, we draw closer to the conclusion. And that conclusion? I don't know, man. We just want to watch Mama Murphy fly, don't we? It's time to finish her quest and remove the final block for me being able to raid Sanctuary once and for all. Got that medex? Fuel for the site? Yeah, here you go. Oh, it just makes everything feel good, don't it? I'll need some buff out if you want the sight. Here. Oh, God. I usually like mixing Psycho in with something else, but I'll need it straight this time. I've got it. Oh, Lord. That's pure. The final piece falls into place. The sun dawns on a new day. She may have been a junkie, but she was the final protector of this place. When Preston and all the others had left, selflessly in her death loop all these weeks, a proper burial is in order. I speak to Shank. We're finally going to take Sanctuary. He collapses from radiation damage. He's been standing next to the pools for too long. It's okay, he'll be back up soon. We're ready. It's time to go. He recommends some final preparations and collapses again. Yes, the radiation flows through you, Shank. The radiation flows through you. Sanctuary falls easily. I am unstoppable. My size is simply a reflection of my power. Larger than life. Watch on as this man panics while Norbalobal eats his bullets. Easy peasy. It is done. Sanctuary falls. The raiders rejoice, but I feel nothing inside. There's a void. The challenge is completed, but the emptiness remains. I still have work to do.
I love how Preston doesn't care about any of this at all. He's just tending to his vegetables. Finch Farm needs some help. The I'm hurt. No. I eat Preston, and the taste of victory gets me thinking. How large would I have grown if I didn't shrink with every death or spend any money? And I worked it out. I earned about 42,000 caps, spent 6,000 on frag mines, and about 3,000 on chems and that sword over the playthrough, meaning I earned approximately 51,000 during the whole challenge. This lands me in at a whopping 500% player scale, a size built for pure domination, which hilariously enough, crashes my PC if I die. Thanks for watching everyone, a huge shout out to the patrons for helping make this happen. Their, their radiation is what poisons my watering holes, and their support allows me to ship videos like this to you all. Big hugs to you guys. If you enjoyed the video, share it with a friend, hit that subscribe button, and then unsubscribe from everyone else, I don't care. Leave a comment about how far you fired Mama Murphy in a junk mortar. And as evidence, leave a screenshot on our Discord, links down below. Lastly, be safe honey, I love you. Ah.